Well, welcome to our opening keynote address and award ceremony. The East-West Institute had a tradition of presenting awards for the most high-level contributions for international service. These awards recognized outstanding leadership and statecraft, especially as it relates to peacemaking. Recipients of the Outstanding Leadership Award included Edward Chevernanze, former Foreign Minister of Georgia, Josef Tosiaski, former Governor of the National Bank of the Czech Republic, and former Prime Minister of the Czech Republic, David Rockefeller, former Chairman and CEO of Chase. Award winners for statecraft included George H.W. Bush, Henry Kissinger, Tony Blair, and Anthony Blinken, among others. Well, the John Edwin Morose Global Leadership is continuing the practice of honoring outstanding international contribution through the John Edwin Morose Award for Distinguished Global Impact. This award is a representation tonight of what you see on the table, a representation of the act of cosmic creation portrayed in glass by the artist Robert Levin. So here to introduce tonight the keynote speaker and the award recipient is President Andrew Hsu. Mr. President. Thank you, Tim. I have the honor and privilege to introduce tonight's keynote speaker and the inaugural recipient of the John Edwin Morose Award for Distinguished Global Impact, Dr. Marshall Goldsmith. And, and in fact, um, I just ran into Dr. S uh, Goldsmith and he informed me that the next speaker is good. Uh, it may be cliche to begin an introduction by saying that the recipient has too many accolades to recount, but in this case, it's simply the truth. Um, I will only be able to mention the highlights of Dr. Goldsmith's career, and so you will want to read his bio. Uh, in the program and watch the full-length film on his career titled An Earned Life. When you do, you will see among his credits that he is a New York Times and Wall Street Journal best-selling author, a writer of 43 books and uh, with another one on the way this spring. Um, it, I haven't even read 43 books, <laughs> much less writing 43 books. <laughs> so um, he has 2.5 million copies uh, sold in 32 languages and has been recognized by numerous organizations such as the Harvard Business Review as top executive coach, mentor, and educator. Marshall has worked with uh, more than 200 major CEOs and their management teams to help position them for success. For our social media fans, he has a point, uh, approximately 1.3 million followers uh, for his uh, LinkedIn account and more than 3 million views on YouTube. On his website, uh, marshallgoldsmith.com, there's access to a lot of free materials such as videos, podcasts, and uh, articles. I'm trying but not succeeding very well at keeping these achievements from turning into uh, a road list, uh, which can easily happen given his numerous accomplishments. 
So instead, let me share some of the advice he has outlined in his books and speeches to give you a sense of his wisdom and impact. I chose a, a, a few quotes from his writings that spoke to me uh, personally. And, and as you know, I'm an engineer and it's very hard to speak to me. <laughs> Uh, in his book, Mojo, How to Get It, How to Keep It, and How to Get It Back If You Lose It, that's the title of the book, um, Marshall writes, improvement is hard. If it were easy, we'd already be better. So, in his book, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, he says, Successful people never drink from a glass that is half empty. And in his book, Triggers, Creating Behavior That Lasts, Becoming the Person You Want to Be, he writes, if I change, I'm inauthentic. Many of us have a misguided belief that how we behave today not only defines us, but represents our fixed and constant self, the authentic us forever. If we change, we're somehow not being true to who we really are. This belief triggers stubbornness. We refuse to adapt our behavior to new situations because it isn't me. Boy, I feel that describes so accurately those of us who work in academia. And finally, the engineer in me really likes uh, his simple equation. He actually has an equation in one of his books um, that I found. Uh, it, it's about leadership, and I quote, uh, less me plus, I, I added the plus sign, more them equals success. So as you can hear in these quotes, Marshall Goldsmith is very much a pragmatic optimist uh, who adapts something all leaders and quite frankly everyone who hopes uh, to be successful in life need to take to heart. Now, let's get to the presentation of the award portion. Dr. Goldsmith, will you please join me on the stage? I would also like to invite uh, Mrs. Karen Linehan Morose and uh, Max Kovalov as representatives of the Morose Global Leadership Institute Steering Committee to join us in presenting the inaugural John Edwin Morose Award for Distinguished Global Impact. I have been warned that the award is quite heavy and I've been told not to drop it. So, <laughs> so I have been coached. So congratulations again to Dr. Goldsmith um, on, the, on such a well-deserved, don't leave yet, uh, on such a well-deserved honor. Uh, the lectern is yours. <laughs> Testing, no? I need an engineer. <laughs> Testing, one, two, can you hear me okay? Now, apologies to the group I was with 
earlier, I'm going to reintroduce myself because I haven't met most of the people. So you've already heard my introduction. Just pretend to be interested. So my name is Marshall. I'm from a small town called Valley Station, Kentucky. Went to undergrad school, a little engineering school, Rose Holman Institute of Technology. Number one small engineering school in America, I might add. So I'm, there you go. <laughs> then I got an MBA at Indiana U and a PhD at UCLA. I was a college professor and dean when I was very young, and then for the next 45 years I did three things. One, I travel all about the world speaking and teaching, so I've been to 102 countries and on the American Airlines I have 11 million frequent flyer miles. So I'm a mega, mega flyer, and then I coach people. I've been the coach of the CEO of Ford, Pfizer, Glaxo, World Bank, Mayo Clinic, a Walmart, on and on and on. And what I love about coaching is that's where I learn everything. And really I see that's my contribution to the world. I mean, I didn't come up with a vaccine for COVID, but I coach Albert Berla, who did. And, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert on climate change, but I was coaching Mark Tursik, who's head of the Nature Conservancy for years. And, you know, I'm not an expert at helping the most vulnerable people in the world, but I coach the head of the International Red Cross. I coach John, who, who basically eliminated nuclear disaster. By the way, that was kind of left out on his bio. I mean, the fact that... He did kind of eliminate us all being blown up in a nuclear holocaust. So let's give the guy a round of applause for that. <laughs> and, and you know, Karen, I could go on and on about the people I've coached, but the bottom line of this is any good that has ever happened in the world is because of me. So, <laughs> so, so then the, I write, write and edit books and articles. You do have a totally outdated bio there. I do have 47 books. And I have uh, six bestsellers, three New York Times bestsellers, one mega big bestseller, and you fail to mention 41 of these books were purchased only by my mother, my father, and friend wrote it. <laughs> so most of the books nobody bought. So what, and then, oh, finally, I'm married 47 years. My wife lied as a psychologist. And we um, lived in Rancho Santa Fe, California for 30 years, just sold our house. Now I live in Nashville, Tennessee. Okay, I'm gonna get ready to impress your kids. One of my neighbors is Keith Urban. His wife is Nicole Kidman. She frequently drugs by the house. The rumors that she's stalking me are probably not true. <laughs> just a rumor, just a rumor. I don't know who started it. But anyway, and okay, but if you want to impress your kids even more, across the street is Taylor Swift. So I, I <laughs> now wait a minute, you're not supposed to act like a teenager. <laughs> Uh, and then, as a hobby, I adopt people. So I went to a program called Design the Life You Love, and a woman said, her are my heroes, and my heroes were kind and generous people who are nice teachers. She said, you should be more like them. I said, what a nice idea. I decided to adopt 15 people, teach them all I know for free. And the only price is when they get old, they have to do the same thing. So I made a little thing and put on LinkedIn. I'm thinking maybe 100 people would apply for adoption. I'll adopt 15. That'd be nice. Nice old man stumbling through life. They laugh at my jokes, and they get old and do the same thing. But I was wrong. So far, over 18,000 people applied to be adopted. So now I've adopted about 350 people. So it's, <laughs> it's a very, very nice program. And my adoptees are just amazing people. So just, you know, just a wonderful group of people. So that's what I do. And we have no money, there's no money, no guilt, no obligation. And the only idea is someone helps you, you go help someone else. So it's a very, really nice concept. Now today, I think I'm going to ignore most of the slides today. I have a general rule, after, between six and seven when people have been drinking, don't lecture too much. So <laughs> we're gonna minimize lecture. So today is gonna be more experiential. Are we ready? Yes. Now, here we are an opportunity to meet new people, and most of you sit with people you already know. <coughs> this is going to change. You're gonna stand up, look around the room, find one person you do not know and sit next to that person. Go, stand up, find somebody you don't know. Go, go, go. Find a partner, let's go. Okay, sit next to your partner. Let's go, go, go. Find a partner. Sit next to, sit, have, sit next to her. There's a clicker should you need it at the podium. Okay. 
Here's a clicker. Yeah, I may or may not ever use it. Big, big buttons to advance. Yeah, yeah probably. Yeah, I'm not going to use it. Too much shit. Okay, sit, sit, sit. Sit by your partner. Sit by your, sit, sit, sit. Sit, shh, 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 sit by your partner. Sit, sit, you guys, sit, 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 sit. Sit by your new partner. Now, we're now gonna practice peer coaching. You are not here to judge your partner. You're not here to critique your partner and you are not here to put your partner down. You're here to help your partner. I want you to shake hands with your partner. Say, partner, my name is, I'm here to help. Go, shake hands with your partner. Go, 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 go. Now, now, since, since our esteemed uh, president over, is that your, you're called president or chancellor? What? President. Since our esteemed president of, is an engineer, I'm going to start with things engineers screw up first. So I'll begin with your problems. We'll see how many of my guesses are accurate. I was interviewed in the, in the, in the Harvard Business Review and asked a question, what is the number one problem of all the successful people you have coached over the years? What is their number one problem? And yes, as I look around the room, I <laughs> sense the problem in this room. Yes, I feel many of you may have this very disease. <laughs> no, the answer is winning too much. Winning too much. Look at her, she's puzzled. Winning too much, what does that mean? What that means is, if it's important, we want to win. Meaningful, we want to win. Critical, we want to win. Trivial, we want to win. And not worth it, we want to win anyway. Winners love winning. In the game of life, you're all winners. It's very hard for winners not to constantly win. I'm now gonna give you a case study of winning too much that almost all my successful clients fail. And I will make a prediction. Almost all of you will fail this case study. When I say fail, you will fail yourself. You will say what I did do is the opposite of what I know I should have done. Are we ready for case number one? She's skeptical, look at that skeptical look. You want to go to dinner at restaurant X. Your husband, wife, friend, or partner wants to go to dinner at restaurant Y. You have heated argument. You go to restaurant Y. It was not your choice. The food tastes awful. The service is terrible. Option A, critique the food. Point out our partner was wrong. This mistake could have been avoided had only you listened to me, 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 me. Option B, shut up. Eat the stupid food. Try to enjoy it and have a nice evening. What would I do? What should I do? Almost all my clients, what would I do? Critique the food. What should I do? Shut up. How many people in the room, please raise your hands, have ever critiqued the food before? Hands in the air. Come on, get these hands up. Yes, a room filled with food critiquers. <laughs> now, my fine college president, was that smart or stupid? Stupid is the right answer. I'm going to help you. <laughs> stupid. <laughs> A little slow. Go with stupid on that one. It's very stupid. Now, as stupid as that was, that is stupid. I'm going to give you an example now that is so hideously stupid, it will make that one pale by comparison. I will predict at least half the people in the room have done this one. Number two. You look less skeptical now. Now, number two. You have a hard day at work. A hard day. Under so much pressure. Push, push, push. More, more, more. Numbers, numbers, numbers. You go home. Your husband, wife, friend, or partner is there, and the other person says, I had such a hard day today. I had such a tough day. And we reply, you had a hard day. You had a hard day. Do you have any idea what I had to put up with today? Do you think you had a hard day? We are so competitive, we have to prove we're more miserable than the people we live with. <laughs> I gave this example to my class at the Dartmouth Tuck School. So a young guy raised his hand. He said, I did that last week. I did it last week. I asked him, what happened? He said, my wife looked at me. She said, honey, you just think you've had a hard day. It is not over. <laughs> now, I got an email in my book, Triggers. And if any of you would send me such an email, I'd be very proud of tonight. I got an email. And a young man said, you know, I just want to send you an email today and say thank you. He said, I know you don't remember me. I was in your class five years ago. He said, 
But I want to say thank you. You said yesterday I was having a hard day at work and I was behind schedule and my wife called. And she was talking about what a hard day she was having and I was just getting ready to point out how her problems paled in significance to my own. And he said, I remembered your course and I, I thought about it and I thought, this is my wife. This is somebody I love. This is not the enemy. He said, I just said, I love you. Thank you for all you've done for the family. He said, I went home, spent $25, bought her some flowers, gave her the flowers and said, I love you. He said, it was the best $25 I've ever spent. Well, the next time we try to win, prove we're right, take a deep breath. Ask a question, what am I winning? What am I winning? And it is hard for successful people not to constantly win. Talk to your partner 20 seconds and answer this question. When is one time in the past you had a need to win and try to prove you were right and you should not have been fighting the battle in the first place? Go, talk to your partner, talk, 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 talk. That's not who I am. It doesn't, that is not who I am. I just do that's, it. That's the way most people like coach. Okay, stop, 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 stop. Shh, shh, shh. Now, second classic problem of smart, successful people. And this next one, engineers are the worst. It's called adding too much value. Now, what does that mean? I'm young, smart, enthusiastic. You're my boss. I come to you with an idea. He thinks it's a great idea. Rather than just saying great idea, our tendency is to say, that's a nice idea. Why don't you add this to it? The problem is the quality of the idea may go up 5%. My commitment to execute just went down 50%. It's no longer my idea, boss. Now it's your idea. Incredibly difficult for smart, successful people not to constantly go through life adding value. Adding value. Very easy in theory, very difficult in practice. One of my coaching clients was named J.P. Garnier. J.P. was the CEO of a very large drug company, GlaxoSmithKline. I said, what did you learn about leadership as the CEO of GlaxoSmithKline? He said, I have learned an incredibly hard lesson. My suggestions become orders. My suggestions become orders. Now, he said, if they're smart, they're orders. If they're stupid, they're orders. If I want them to be orders, they are orders. And if I do not want them to be orders, they're orders anyway. For nine years, I trained admirals in the Navy. What's the first thing I teach those new admirals? When you get that star, your suggestions become orders. Admirals don't make suggestions. When an admiral makes a suggestion, what's the response? Sir, yes, sir. That suggestion becomes an order. I asked JP, what did you learn from me when I was your coach that helped you the most? He said, you taught me one lesson that helped me be a better leader and have a happier life. He said, before I speak, breathe. And ask myself one question, is it worth it? Is it worth it? And he said, as the CEO of this big company, 50% of the time I've had the discipline to stop and to breathe and ask myself, is it worth it? What did I decide? Am I right? Maybe. Is it worth it? No. No. Now, the next one. Now we're going to practice. I'm going to have each of you pick one thing to do better. Not 30, not 50, not 100. Just one thing. Maybe be a better listener, or better at recognition, or I don't know, more decisive, less decisive, whatever it is for you. Okay, our president, what's one thing you need to improve here? I need to be able to better remember people's names. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> How about you? What's one thing for you to get better? I, I am really working at trying to listen. Listen, listen better. Okay, very good. Uh, how about you? I'm trying to, so let go of the idea that I always have to have You what? Yeah, let go of that. You always have to have the answer, right? That's a good one. Uh, how about you? How about my colleague up there? Coaching moment, coaching moment. <laughs> Are you ready? Coaching for her. Now, never say what you just said. You said, I am terrible at that. Don't talk that way. If you want to change, no, raise your right hand. I used to be terrible. I do not have an incurable genetic defect. 
therefore I can change. Let's hear it for her. Yay! <laughs> A very good point. Don't ever, if you want to change, don't stereotype yourself. As long as you say that's just the way I am, guess what? That's the way you're going to stay. You don't have an incurable genetic defect. You can do this. You can do this. Look at her face. Look at her face. You can do this. You can do this. Now, we can all get better at something. So we're going to practice something called feed forward. As I said, we're going to have a lively night here because I'm not going to give you hours of lecture after two drinks of champagne. So how does feed forward work? You're all going to pick one area for improvement, not 30, not 50, not 100, just one. That's all. And then you're going to talk to your partner and say, partner, here's what I want to get better at. And then you say, good partner, here's why this is important for me to improve at this. Then your partner says, here's what I want to get better at, and here's why it's important for me to get better at this one thing. So everybody's going to pick one thing, you talk to your partner, here's what I want to get better at, and here's why it's important to me. Do you all understand the rules? No, oh, I forgot something, I forgot something. If you cannot think of even one thing that you do need to improve, pick humility. <laughs> So talk to your partner. Partner, here's what I want to get better at. Here's why it's important to me. And then the other partner says it back. Go! Talk to your partner. Talk, 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 talk. Okay, stop, stop, stop. Shh, 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 shh. We are now going to practice something called feed forward. Now, I love feed forward. This is the essence of how I coach people. This is a wonderful tool you can use to help yourself get better, to coach other people, or if you get to give a talk like this, it's a great thing to break up. Have you been in one of those boring corporate meetings where they have finance slides hour after hour after hour, and people are you know, shooting up amphetamines just to kind of stay awake? Well, <laughs> this is a really nice way to kind of break things up for people. They get to stand up, move around, and they, and they learn stuff. Now, here's how Feed Forward works. In Feed Forward, you're going to be in two roles. Role number one is called learn as much as I can. Do your hands like this. Hands. Look around the room. Look at all the faces. Now. Are there some smart people in this room, yes or no? Yes. If you had a chance to learn from these smart people, would you like to do that? Yes. Do your hands again. Are there some nice people in this room, yes or no? Yes. If you had a chance to help these nice people, would you like to help them? Well, you're either learning from these smart people, which is good, or helping these nice people, which is also good. Therefore, it is all good. Now, what are the rules of feed forward? Rule number one is no feedback about the past. No feedback about the past. We spend too much time in our lives chattering about the past. Look up here. Have any of you been impressed with your wife, husband, or partner's near photographic memory of your previous sins? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, wait. They're both looking at each other, right? <laughs> now, I, w I want you to look at, look at each other. It's, now, you look at her. Now, I want you both to smile and smile. Take a deep breath and do your hand like this. I want you to go, ah, oh, hand, hand, ah. Oh. <laughs> you see, whatever sins anyone in this room has committed up until this second in time, we're not going to fix them anyway. All those sins he committed in the past, ah, oh, let it go, let it go. You know what he's thinking? He's thinking, good trade, good trade, good trade. <laughs> 
yeah, yeah, yeah. This is good. Yeah, I forgive you. You forgive me. Let's call it even. He's really happy with the trade. So rule one is no feedback about the past. We spend too much time in our lives talking about the past. Only ideas for the future. Rule two is harder. You cannot judge or critique ideas. When people give you ideas, you can't say good idea, bad idea. I already knew that. That will never work. Whatever people tell you, you ought to stand there, shut up, listen, take notes, and say thank you. Say thank you. Now, I'm a Buddhist. This is a Buddhist exercise. Buddha said, only do what I teach if it works for you. If it doesn't work for you, it's okay. Just don't do it. So I ask him for an idea. He gives me an idea. Treat the idea like a gift. If someone gives us a gift, should we say, stinky gift, bad gift. I don't like your stupid gift. What should we say to the nice person who gives us a gift? Thank you. If you want to use the gift, use it. If you do not wish to use the gift, put it in the closet. If you already have the gift, repackage it and give it to your mother-in-law. Just say thank you. So how does this work? You're going to say, my name is, I want to get better at. One or two quick ideas from your colleague. No more than one minute each. What if he gives you the dumbest idea in the world? What do you say anyway? Just say thank you. The other person says, my name is, I want to get better at. Thank you. Shake hands. Talk to someone else. Now, I did bring valuable prizes for the winner. Whoever has the most conversations is going to, I think this is me, aha, a book that was mentioned by me earlier, what got you here won't get you there, right? So this is your prize winning opportunity. You're going to talk to as many people as you can talk to in about four minutes. You say, my name is, I want to get better at, thank you, shake hands. Name is, I want to get better at, thank you, shake hands. Then after you talk to someone, here's the key, you must raise your hands. Why? That way they know you don't have a partner. So people look around and see you don't have a partner, and then you talk to them and you talk to more people, more people, more people, until I say stop. You all understand the rules? Okay, so you all stand up this side, go toward here, walk this way. In fact, go up there. You all get up here. In fact, we can do this. Everybody get, get out from behind the desk. You guys get over here and come up this way. Okay, okay get out from behind the desk. Let's go, 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 go. Get out from behind desk. All right, everybody, just keep one side or the other. Very good. All right. Shh, 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 shh. Are we ready? Do you all understand the rules? Do not start with your partner. To your marks. Get set. Talk to as many people as you can talk to in four minutes. Go, 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 go. Love you because of this. I'd like to. 
Hello. Marshall. Hello. What do you want to get better at? Perseverance. Perseverance. Write it down and get somebody to coach every day. I'll talk about that later. What do you want to get better I at? Want to, I want to get better at delegating. Okay. It's what you do. Okay, stop. Stay where you are. Ho! Oh, stay where you are. Stop. Ho, oh, Mike. Ho! Oh, stop. Stay where you are. Stop. Stop. Stop, stop, stop. Now, I'm going to begin a sentence. I'm going to leave out the last word. You think of a word. Don't say anything until I go like this. When I go like this, you will loudly shout out that word. But wait until I go like this. Okay, you ready? This little exercise was help. What is the first word I heard? Fun. What's the last word you think to describe any feedback activity? Fun. Has anyone ever called you on the phone and said, I have feedback I'd like to share with you. Come into my office. And you said, fun, fun, fun. <laughs> Fun is the last word you think of. Yet I have done this exercise with hundreds of thousands of people around the world. I did this in St. Petersburg before the COVID, 50,000 people at once in a football stadium. They loved it, and only 20% even spoke English. <laughs> now, remain standing. Join a group with three, four, three or four people. Remain standing, three or four people. Go, get in a group. Go, 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 get in a group. Stop, 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 shh, oh, stop. Each group needs a spokesperson. Raise your right hand in the air. Raise your right hand in the air. Ra hand, hand, raise the right hand. Okay, point, point. When I count to three, point to the spokesperson in your group. One, two, three, point. Okay, shh, shh, shh. You now have 30 seconds. Why do people say the exercise is positive, useful, helpful, or even fun, as opposed to painful? Why? Go talk to your partner. Why, 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 why? Okay, stop. Shh, shh, shh. Okay, one comment per team. Who's the spokesperson? Okay. It was quick. Quick. Excellent. One thing we do in coaching is we talk too much. I give you my best idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I talk more. Second best idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I talk an hour. 75th best idea. What happens to the quality of our ideas is we keep babbling. They get worse and worse and worse. So in coaching, it's better to have one good idea than 20 ideas, which probably most of them are stupid. Who's the spokesperson? Okay, why? No consequences, and it was fast. No consequences. You don't have to do it. Somebody gives you an idea, you don't like it. Nobody's making you do it anyway. You've got nothing to lose. On the inside, you might think you're an idiot. But on the outside, you just say, thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, why? Who's the spokesperson? It's kind of a cool experience to admit something you're not good at to somebody you've never met before. It is. Now, by the way, all my clients do this over and over and over again. They all publicly stand up. I don't know if you know who Hubert Jolie is, the CEO of Best Buy. He turned that company around. Spectacular success. He stands up in front of everybody in Best Buy. My name is Hubert. Here's what I want to do better. Please help me. But what's the expectation? Everyone else in the company does the same thing. Hey, who are we kidding here? We all got stuff we can do better. So the exercise, positive, useful, helpful, and fun. But let's see who won the prize. How many of you talked to at least three people? Four or more? Five? 
How many? I'll give you seven. More than seven? How many? A dozen. Can anybody beat a dozen? No, wait. One dozen. Wait, wait, wait. What were you? Shh, 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 shh. Sh. Talk about competitive over here. Oh, yeah, look. Oh, talk about bad sportsmanship. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're whining because he won. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, Robert, what were you trying to improve? Uh, reading your book. <laughs> exactly, the library. <laughs> What's your one area for improvement? Patience. Pa oh, I love it. Yeah, his problem is patience. I'm too patient. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. <laughs> Let's hear it for our winner, Robert. Yay. Okay, go back and sit by your partner. Go back and sit by your partner. Okay, sit by your good partner. Now, shh, shh, now I'm going to teach you just a couple of other quick things we're going to wrap up. First, get in the habit of asking a question. A question we in life do not ask enough. What is this simple question? How can I be a better? Yeah, we're real good on how can you be better. The question we don't ask enough is how can I be better? How can I be a better? Now, we're going to practice something called a participant response activity. I'm going to ask you questions. If the answer is yes, wait till I go like this. You're going to say yes in a very loud voice. If the answer is no, you remain silent. OK, ready? In your fine organizations, is customer satisfaction important? Yes. Should we ask our customers for their good ideas? Yes. Should we listen to our good customers? Yes. Do you have a husband, wife, or partner at home? Yes. Have you spent a lot of time asking that husband, wife, or partner what can I do to be a better partner in our relationship? <laughs> uh, I notice a massive dip in the level of enthusiasm. <laughs> eh, eh, eh. Who has a husband, wife, or partner at home and you have not been asking this question, how can I be a better? Come on, hands up, you're guilty. Up, the bad president's hand is up. <laughs> now, I am very confused. Who is more important, those customers that don't even know your name, or that person at home who seems to love you on occasion? Who's more important? My wife. Your wife. And you have not been asking your wife this question. <laughs> bad president. Very bad. Are you, are, are, are you, are you going to start doing this, yes or no? When are you yes. going to begin? Tonight. That's close. The right answer is no. now. Everyone, get out your cell phone. It's time to send a text message. Get out, come on. Get out your cell phones. You are going to send a text message to your wife, husband, or partner with one question and no explanation. What is a question? How can I be a better partner? How, in our relationship, how can I send those text messages? <laughs> how can I be a better partner? <laughs> Now, sh while you're sending your messages, I've done this with thousands of people. I get some hilarious responses. The funniest are almost always from the wife. Let me give you a few of my favorites. One of my favorites, who has stolen my husband's cell phone? <laughs> Another favorite, this is your wife, who is this intended for? <laughs> and then there's a classic, who have you been sleeping with? <laughs> So I've done this with thousands of people. I've had three people call the husband on the assumption he must be dying. Three times, the, the guy must be dying. He asked me how he could be a better partner. This is what's wrong here. On the positive side, two people told me this saved their marriage, though. Twice, people said this saved my marriage. So, you know, if it only saved two marriages, it's all worth it anyway. So this is a great exercise. Get in the habit of asking that question, how can I be a better? Not only at work, but also at home. My daughter Kelly was 11 years old. My son Brian was nine years old. I began asking my children a question, a question we as parents don't ask enough. What can I do to be a better parent? If it's worthwhile to say, how can I be a better boss, supplier, partner, how about parent? That's more important. I asked my daughter, what can I do to be a better father? She said, Daddy, you travel a lot. That's not what bothers me. What bothers me is the way you act when you come home. You talk on the phone, you watch sports, you don't spend much time with me. And she said, one time it was Saturday and I wanted to go to a party at my friend's house, but mommy didn't let me go. 
I had to stay home and spend time with you. And then she said, you spent no time with me. That was not right. What could I say? Mm, thank you. Thank you. Daddy must do better. I said, I'm going to keep track of how many days I could spend four hours with my family. 1991, 92 days. 1992, 110. 1993, 131. 1994, 135. Now it's January 1, 1995. Both children are teenagers. Daddy's proud. I have my charts. I said, look kids, 135 days, four hours with daddy. What goal this year? How about 150? They both said, no, no, daddy, no, no, no. You have overachieved. <laughs> <laughs> my, my son said 50 is a much better target. <laughs> they both voted for a massive cutback of daddy. I learned a good lesson. When they're little, it's good to do this. Why? They need us. When they get older, it's important for a different reason. We need them. How many of you do have grown-up kids? How fast did those years pass? Yeah, good to do this at work, better to do it at home. I was teaching a class for a company called the Kaiser Permanente Company. A thousand people in the room in the Oakland Convention Center and a woman named Trudy Triner, who wrote a book about this later, raised her hand. She said, there's always something you've forgotten. Teach people to ask this question to their parents. Teach people to ask this to their parents. She said, I went to your class and my daughter was 17. And I asked her, how can I be a better mother? We had such a nice talk, and she said, how can I be a better daughter? I said, that was so nice, I should call my mother. She said, I called my mother and said, what can I do to be a better daughter? Her mother said, daddy's dead. I live alone in the country, and every day I take a long walk up the road. And almost every day when I go to the mailbox, there's nothing in the mailbox. And that makes me so sad. She said it would mean so much to me if you just send me a little picture or card or something. I'd walk to the mailbox, I'd see something in the mailbox. She started sending her mother little pictures and cards every day. What did that cost her? Nothing. What did that mean to her mother? A lot. She sent me an email three years later, and the email said, my mother just died. The last thing her mother told her before she died was, thank you. Thank you for doing that. If your parents are alive, this is a very nice thing to do for three reasons. One is good for them. Even if they tell you you don't have anything to improve, they'll be proud you cared enough to ask. Number two is good for you. What's the number one regret kids have when mom and dad die? Why didn't I thank them for all the nice things they did for me? Why was I judging them all the time? And number three, if you do have little kids, it's good for the kids. Why? You know the old people you're calling up on the phone? Guess what? That's gonna be you. That's gonna be you. You want the kid calling you on the phone? Your kid is not gonna, your kid's not gonna listen to what you say. The little kid's gonna watch what you do. Our values are not what we say, they're what we do. Talk to your partner 20 seconds and answer this question. Who's one person you should be asking the question, how can I be better too? Go, talk to your partners, talk, talk, talk. Did you get a note back? I did. It says, oh my God, what possessed you? What's that? Oh my God, what possessed you? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you mind if I tell the group? I love no, that. No, it's good. <laughs> My God. <laughs> but, how can I do better? Yeah. <laughs> show, show her, show her. <laughs> so who do, you need to, who do you need to ask this question? My mom. We both said moms. They're moms. Good. But I'm a little nervous what my mom will say. <laughs> yeah. Not too late. Is she, she in? Is she Okay. Shh, shh, shh. Stop, stop, stop. Uh, do I have, we have a reply here from someone's wife. Uh, can you read this to the group? Oh my God, what possessed you? <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going to teach you something, two more things to go. One takes, I'm going to teach you something that takes about five minutes a day, costs nothing, is going to help you get better at almost anything. Some of you are skeptical. Five minutes a day, costs nothing, help me get better at almost anything. Sounds too good to be true. Half the people who start doing this quit within two weeks. And they do not quit because it doesn't work, they quit because it does work. What I'm going to teach you next is incredibly easy to understand. It's phenomenally difficult to do. 
This is called the daily question process. How does it work? Get out a spreadsheet. On one column, write down a series of questions that represent what's most important in your life. Could be friends, family, coworkers. Questions about life. Every question must be answered with a yes, a no, or a number. Seven boxes across on the spreadsheet. Yes is recorded as a one, no is a zero, or a number. At the end of the week, you get a report card. I'm going to warn you in advance. The report card you get at the end of the week will not be as beautiful as the corporate values plaque you got stuck up on the wall. I've been doing this for 25 years. When you do this every day, you know what you very quickly learn. You learn that life is incredibly easy to talk. And life is incredibly difficult to do. I have somebody call me on the phone almost every day for the past 25 years just so I'll do this. Why? Somebody said, why do I have somebody call me on the phone every day? Don't I know the theory about how to change? I wrote the theory about how to change. Why do I have somebody call me on the phone every day? My name is Marshall. I'm too cowardly to do this stuff by myself. I'm too undisciplined to do this stuff by myself. I need help. And you know what? It's okay. We all need help. You think this is easy, you proved one thing. You've never done this. This is so difficult to do. It is hard to look in the mirror every day. Now, I'll share some of my questions, but they're not intended to be yours. One of my questions every day is, how many times yesterday did you try to prove you were right when it wasn't worth it? Mm, I'm not seeing too many zeros on my scar. Now, you're the old professor here, is that correct? Yeah. How, how about you on that one? A little room for improvement there? Yes. Yeah. How about the president over there, Mr. President? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe try to be right just a little bit too much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another one, how many angry or destructive comments did I make about people yesterday? I don't see enough zeros on that one either. We don't want other people stabbing us in the back. Why do we stab them in the back? How many steps did you take? How many push-ups? How many sit-ups? How much do you weigh? Did you say or do something nice for your wife, your son, your daughter, your grandkids? Just questions about life. How many minutes did you write? All those books, they didn't write themselves. Every day, day after day after day. This works. It is so hard to do. It's hard to look in the mirror every day and face the reality of our own lives. All those stories we have about what we want to do, those are stories. When you start measuring every day, it's tough. It's very, very tough. Talk to your partner and answer this question. What, are, what is one question you should be challenging yourself with every day? Go talk to your partner. Go, go, go. Okay, stop, stop, stop. Now, I'm now going to finish with my favorite coaching exercise in the whole world. You're now going to get the best coaching advice you're going to get in this or perhaps any other lifetime. Are we ready? Here it comes. Everyone look up here. Smile, smile. Take a deep breath. Ah, oh, do your hand like this. Hand. Ah, 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 hand. Yeah, hand, hand, hand. Now, this is the best advice you're going to get. Take a deep breath. Ah, I want you to imagine you're 95 years old and you're just getting ready to die. You're on that deathbed. Here comes the last breath. Right before you take that breath, you're given a beautiful gift. The ability to go back in time and talk to the person in this room. The ability to help this person be a better leader, better professional, much more important. The ability to help this person have a better life. What advice would the wise 95-year-old you, who knows what mattered in life and what did not matter and what was important and what was not important, what advice would that wise old person facing death have for the you that's sitting in this room right now? Don't say anything. Don't want you to do anything. Answer that question in your mind. What advice would that old person have for you? Whatever you're thinking now, do that. 
in terms of a performance appraisal, that is the only one that's going to matter. That old person says you did the right thing, you did. That old person says you made a mistake, you did. You do not have to impress anybody else. Some friends of mine interviewed old people and asked this question, what advice would you have? Personal side, three themes. Theme number one, three words, be happy now. Not next week, not next month, not next year. Be happy now. The great Western disease, I will be happy when. When I get that PhD or when I get that money or status or achievement, I will be happy when. We all have exactly the same when. That old person is when. Learning point from old people. I get so busy chasing what I did not have, I couldn't see what I did have. And I had just about everything. Learning point number two, friends and family. When you're 95 years old and you look around the deathbed, none of your coworkers are waving goodbye. You start to realize this friends and family, they're kind of important. They're only people here today. Don't get so busy climbing that ladder of success that you forget the people you love. That happens too much. Final one, if you have a dream, go for it. Because you don't go for it when you're 45, you may not when you're 55, you probably won't when you're 85. It doesn't have to be a big dream, maybe a small dream. Go to New Zealand, speak Spanish, play a guitar. Other people think your dream is goofy. Who cares? It's not their dream anyway. It's your dream. It's not their life. It's your life. I had a very embarrassing experience a few years ago. I was teaching this class, and I said, go to New Zealand. Speak Spanish. I raised his hand. He said, we're in Spain, you idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Business advice isn't much different. Number one, life is short. Have fun. Number two, do whatever you can do to help people. The main reason to help people has nothing to do with money or status or getting ahead. The main reason to help people is much more important. The 95-year-old you will be proud of you because you did, and the 95-year-old you will be disappointed if you do not. And if you do not believe this is true, interview any CEO who has retired. I've interviewed very many and ask them one question. Please tell me, what are you proud of? None told me how big their office was. All they ever talked about is people they helped. Final advice also the same, go for it. The world's changing, your industry's changing, do what you think is right, you may not win. At least you can look in the mirror and say, what the heck, at least I tried. Old people, we almost never regret the risk we take and fail. We always regret the risk we fail to take. And finally, Number one, thank you for my very nice award. I appreciate that, Karen. Thank you so much for the nice award. Number two, congratulations on the school. I mean, if those kids were anything like the rest of your students, they should be really proud. Big round of applause for them. And then, finally, as I've grown older, my level of aspiration has actually gone down and down and down. My level of impact's gone up and up and up. Why? I quit worrying about what I'm not gonna change. So my goal is pretty simple. I hope you have just a little better life. That's enough. So I hope something I said today maybe help you have just a little bit better life. Thank you so much.